Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Engineer and Future Podcast. I am your host, Luis Duque. And this week, I bring a conversation with Pat Sweet. He is an engineer that has been doing some amazing work. So I wanted to bring him to the podcast, talk to, to him about some of his productivity tips, some of his um, uh, management skills that he has. He has in his own podcast and it was just fantastic talk to him and getting to know him a little bit. I really hope you guys enjoyed the conversation with him today and make sure you check him out on social media and check his podcast, Engineering Leadership Podcast, for a lot more information about what he's doing. So before we start this episode, let me tell you about PPI. Uh, PPI is one of the best resources on the internet for the FE, PE, and the SE exams. I've told you about PPI in the past. Uh, they have a lot of resources in terms of questions, practice problems, practice exams, books, programs, classes, everything related to these exams. They pretty much have it. And they've been a supportive of the podcast for the past few months, uh, very closely since we started the podcast. So I've been very glad to get to know them and get to know more of the resources. And I always recommend you check them out because I truly think they have some of the best resources on the internet. So if you go to ppi2pass.com slash Luke, you can get 15% discount on their products. And the second supportive of this episode is Audible. Audible has some of the, one of the largest libraries in terms of art books, podcasts, uh, stories and some other things they have going on. So I really recommend you check them out. I've been listening to audiobooks uh, recently and it's been a lot of fun and it's it's some something that I think it's productive because I'm able to either work in the kitchen or clean up around the house or do other things while li- listening to the audiobook. So make sure you check Audible. Uh, if you go to audibletrial.com slash engineering our future, you can get a free month of Audible Premium plus an audiobook for you to listen. So make sure you check them out, audibletrial.com slash engineering our future. So without further ado, let's jump right into today's content. Welcome to the Engineering Our Future podcast, a podcast where I bring you relevant content from personal experience and guests to help young engineers, students, and international students succeed in their careers. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Engineer Our Future podcast. Today, I have a very special guest, Pat Sui. I met him on LinkedIn and kind of reached out, connected. We're doing a lot of similar things, so I figured I'll get him on the podcast, and uh, we'll be talking about some productivity, leadership, and other great topics uh, come uh, going along in the engineering industry. So, Pat, do you want to give us a little introduction on what you do and, and kind of what you're doing with your your podcast and your side business and everything going on in your life? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so like you mentioned, my name is Pat Sweet. I live in, in Halifax, Nova Scotia, the, the far east coast of Canada. And I've got a blog and a podcast called Engineering and Leadership. And I started that in 2012 as a way to explore uh, my, my own understanding and my own practice of, of leadership and management as an engineer. And it's it's obviously grown over the years. Um, and, and really what I focus on today is, is about uh, management in an engineering context, both uh, both at a, at a personal level, right? Self-management, so you get into things like productivity and mindset, um, and then uh, also at, a, at a, a team and business level, how do you manage engineers and, and engineering projects for success? So that's really my, my sweet spot. Yeah, I've been listening to your podcast for the past uh, couple months. I know you kind of took a little break in between kind of the beginning and now kind of resurfacing the podcast. Uh, he's gotten some great interviews and t- talking about a lot of great topics that really interest me. And, and it's, I, I'm very glad that I found you when I did. Uh, so let's just get started. Uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you is I, I know you write a lot about productivity, time management, and kind of creating um, resources and creating methods to become more productive and kind of save time at the end of the day. I just kind of wondering what's your definition of productivity and how do you see productivity um, in, in your own words? Oh, that really, really good question. And the, the timing is perfect because I just finished up a, uh, a productivity course last night, actually. This is the first thing I do <laughs> since, oh, wow. since ending that course. Um, and and uh, I've got a, a, a concept that I call the productivity pyramid. And what that explains is that is that productivity is more than just being efficient being efficient is important that's one of the three the three legs in the pyramid efficiency is doing things well but there are two other two other segments one is effectiveness 
which is doing the right thing in the first place, doing things that bring you closer to your goals. And the third is to be systematic, meaning if you, if you know how to be efficient, you know how to be effective, that's great, but you need to bake those skills into your everyday life such that over the long run, you, you, you're, you're pro productive on a daily basis and, and better and better and better over time. So those are three key elements, effectiveness, efficiency, and systematic. And that's what I, I taught in that course is to help people see um, what their goals really are, what projects that they have on their list today that may or may not have anything to do with those goals, meaning a lot of people have a bunch of work on their plates that, that they really shouldn't have, are really getting in the way. There's major opportunity costs to working on stuff that that is not progressing you toward what you really want in your life and your career. Um, and then we also got into the nitty gritty on, you know, how to, uh, how to tackle email in an efficient way, how to tackle meetings in an efficient way, all of this, uh, all of the stuff that we all face as engineers, yet no one ever trains us how to do, right? Um, I recently, uh, tell you a little story, I recently got my, uh, my PMP, my uh, project management professional designation. One of the, one of the nice things about the pandemic, if, if you can even say there's a nice thing, nice thing about a pandemic is that you have all this free time. So this was on my bucket list. So I, I ended up studying and, uh, and, and getting the designation. One of the core concepts is that communication is 90% of what a project manager does. And I, I suspect the same thing can be said for most engineers too. Um, but no one ever teaches that stuff. No one ever teaches you how to link up with other people in a productive way. So it's that kind of thing that I really, I really think is important uh, when we talk about productivity as engineers. Yeah, I think that's great. And and I recently listened to your your podcast episode about email and how to handle email and kind of some of the principles to handle email in, in terms of not really checking your email every five minutes. You know, you, people are not expecting you to reply right away when they're sending an email. So I think for the people that listen to this, I will link that on the episode on the episode show notes for you to kind of dive deeper into that conversation. But um, do you want to just give us a one two minute explanation on, on kind of your concept of email, and maybe we'll move forward into like maybe task management and just project management as a whole? Because I know that's something you do quite a bit on, on your career. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so with email, one thing that's important for us all to recognize with email is that none of us are email engineers. And maybe you've got listeners who, who work for, you know, on the Outlook product or, or on Gmail. You, you guys are email engineers. The rest of us, are, our jobs are not <laughs> to answer email, right? Our jobs are to design something, a product, a service. And when you bear that in mind, it's ridiculous the kind of time that we spend in our inboxes. So the, the first and most important thing that I, I, I teach is to time box the amount of time you spend in your inbox. So... I will literally schedule a couple of meetings with myself each day to check my inbox and, and then process messages from most to least important, as opposed to whatever just showed up most recently. And for me, most to least important is, uh, is dictated by who sends those messages. So every time I check my inbox, I I've already got filters and rules set up to categorize my messages. And, and the things I look at first are messages from my clients from my management and from my team. Those are always going to be more important to me than any other message coming in. Now, what that means is occasionally something that is actually kind of important drifts to the bottom. Now, it, it's important when you make strategic decisions like this that you acknowledge that little bad things may happen. Um, I've not gotten fired yet, right? <laughs> and. <laughs> What you realize is if you don't respond to every last little message within 24 hours, the, the world continues spinning and everything will be okay. So you really can give yourself permission to time box email, focus on what's most important, and then get back to your day job. Now, at the end of every week or two, I'll, I'll also set aside some time to, to do a big cleanup, right? To, to effectively declare email bankruptcy, <laughs> go through every last little thing, <laughs> um, archive, archive, and delete, and, and move on. Um, and that affords me the opportunity to check in every so often, make sure I haven't missed anything important. And between you and I, if something really is truly both important and urgent, you're going to get a phone call or an IM, or you're going to bump into someone in the hallway. 
Um, there, there, there's more than one way to skin a cat and people are, are pretty creative about finding ways of getting a hold of you. So that's, uh, from, from a, a yeah, I totally 30, agree. And view, that, that's how I approach it. Yeah. And I think one of the things you talk about in, in your podcast episode is kind of setting up those rules, as you said, and tackling the most important emails first, because those are the ones that you kind of need to either acknowledge still the people, okay, I got your email. I'm going to take action in the next couple of days. Um, that's something I try to do just because I don't like let, giving a, like sending an email and not getting a response for two, three, four, or sometimes even a week. And they may be working on it. They may not have received the email. Like you will never know. And something that I've done on my personal account uh, is Gmail has some incredible filtering properties and abilities that the way I've set it up is I only give my quote unquote personal email to people that I kind of reach out directly, people I'm working with and people that um, I'm constantly emailing back and forth and such. And then with my G Suite account, I actually have what they call aliases. Mm. And on those aliases, I, I, I sign up for like my bank account and all of that stuff with those email addresses. So once they come to that email address, it's already filtered to um, taking advantage of the multiple inbox in Gmail. So creating those rules and actually taking advantage of the multiple inbox feature in, G in Gmail, it's, it's been a game changer because I know my personal email is always in one inbox and that's the email that I need to check and review every single day. The rest of the emails can just be left behind and sometimes you just even archive as, as soon as they come in. So I think that's a really powerful way of seeing email and, and kind of tackling those what seem like tedious process of like, I literally get like hundreds of emails a day. Like it's impossible. I'm going to get through all of those. Um, and kind of just moving from that uh, to the task manage management portion, I use a program called like Notion where I just organize everything there. I'm kind of curious what you use and maybe just give us a little rundown on kind of your methods and strategies to manage tasks. Um, like do you use an inbox, do you use um, different tools to kind of get to those tasks and how do you take yeah, action? Yeah, really good question. And I've experimented with a number of different things in the past um, for, for my personal task management system right now, I'm using a, a tool called Todoist. Uh, and the, the pro version of that is like 30 bucks a year. Is it really, really, really reasonable? Um, and one of the things that I do is, um, first of all, nothing lives in my email inbox. If I need to take action and can't do it right away, I, I will forward to my Todoist inbox and then archive the email. So I try to try to keep my email inbox clean, just like just like you'd never leave anything in your physical mailbox in the front of your home <laughs> because it, it just wouldn't work. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I approach things in a similar way with my my digital inbox. In Todoist, I organize everything into um, into to projects, but most importantly, into contexts. And what I mean by that is I'll tag each of my tasks according to uh, what it's going to take for me to accomplish them. Meaning, is it a phone call? Do I have to be uh, at the grocery store? Do I have to be home? Do I have to be at the office? And Todoist is really good for, for things like uh, geotag reminders. It knows when I show up at the office and will remind me, hey, make sure that you drop off whatever, uh, the coffee mug back to Dave because you stole his coffee mug. Mm -hmm. um, and having these, these little prompts throughout the day to take advantage of the opportunities that you have then and there, I find are very powerful. The other thing that I do with my tasks is on a on a regular basis. Um, so every every morning as part of my my morning routine, I'll review the tasks that I've assigned myself for the day to make sure that they make sense, and I'll literally block time out in my calendar to execute those tasks. That's super super important. Is I've made a decision now. I need to uh, allocate resources effectively. Right, that resource being time to getting that stuff done because otherwise the, the day will get away from me, right? There, there are a thousand demands on my time, uh, busy at work, busy as a dad and a husband and a homeowner and a, I've got a dog and right. So if I, if I don't <laughs> make that commitment, it won't happen. One of the, one of the ways that, uh, helps me to decide what's going to show up on a given day is if something really is time bound, um, that that's easy, right? You have to go to the dentist at a certain time. That's there's no way around that. For everything else, I prioritize based on on urgency and importance. So something that is both urgent and important 
gets a uh, priority one sticker in, in Todoist. I don't know, have you ever heard of a, a, an Eisenhower matrix? You're familiar with the term? Yeah, yeah, yep. perfect. So yep. yeah, importance on one axis, urgency on the other. Um, you always prioritize things that are important, but not urgent over what's urgent, but not important. Though the, the inclination for most people is to, is, is to flip those. And obviously something that's both important and urgent, you, you, you got to tackle that right away. Um, so Todoist has all these, all these tags for me. And it lets me on a daily basis, check to see what ought to come next. And then on a weekly basis, again, I schedule time for myself Saturday mornings to go through my whole to-do list and make sure that nothing is overcome by events and, and obsolete and I can just delete it. Or maybe something has changed in my life that I need to have a really hard look at whether something's a priority anymore, right? Um, what, one of the things that you'll, you'll probably pick up on is the fact that I, I thrive on routines and I use my calendar to execute or to protect the time that I need for those routines. Um, and not that it happens every day, but because it happens most days, uh, it works. Right. And, and it's in those, it's in those times where I decide, oh, I, I, I don't need to show up to my own meeting <laughs> that that's when things start to go off the rails. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's super interesting. I always I'm kind of a productivity junk, if you call it. Like, I like to read books about productivity, right? Uh, watch videos, everything. And so it's it's always interesting to see the the way of thinking of other people and how they manage their task and their time. And it's it's always just fascinating to me to hear kind of different perspectives of of how you are managing your time compared to how I manage my time. Um, but at the same time it all comes down to like basic rules of doing the right things at the right time, scheduling time to do the things that matter the most, like using your calendar along with your task manager. Um, I personally don't like use my calendar as a task manager per se. Like I, I schedule time when I know there is going to be something that is really important that is going to happen. Like I need to be there at that time or I need to get these tasks done during this time. So I schedule maybe a couple of hours of like deep focus time where I know this is the one thing that I'm working on. So it's always fascinating to me hearing you talk about how you manage your tasks and other people that I've interviewed in the podcast or I've done just talk on, on, on my volunteer and everything, how they manage time is just fascinating to me. So it's it's kind of great to see kind of the differences that uh, we all have on, on the way we think and the way we plan everything. So um, it's it's just fascinating. I always learn something new every time I talk to, to yeah, someone. It's, it, it, um, it's... Kind of moving Sorry, go for it. Go, oh, go I was just say you, you, you reminded me of a, a bit of a, a, a funny story. Last night I was saying that uh, we wrapped up our, our, our productivity pyramid course, and um, one of the guys who was in on the course, a fellow named Jeff Perry. And, and if you've not had Jeff on the on the podcast yet, he's he is an excellent, excellent engineer. Um, I'm actually chatting with him on Friday, so hopefully he will be some. Oh, podcast perfect, soon. perfect. He's, he's a class act, yep. and uh, he and I got into a discussion about. Um, he, he had a question about goal setting, right? And, and how to, and how to uh, line up projects with goals. And, and I gave him two or three different options. He said, Pat, you're, you're killing me. Like, <laughs> just give me the answer. And, and he said it tongue in cheek, knowing that, you know, that there's no one, one size fits all answer for this kind of thing. And, and productivity is the same way. And one of the things that I teach is I'll, I'll equip students with a bunch of different tools and, and explain why I use the ones that I use while also acknowledging that others might work better for others. So, so hearing those different perspectives is, is to my way of thinking, super, super important. Even, even if you disagree or it doesn't work in your situation, knowing that they're out there is good. Maybe your situation will change, right? So, uh, yeah. And I think with that, with that being said is realizing that the tools are not making you more productive right. and the tools are just a way of you to record what you actually need to do and a way to, maybe help you a little bit in how to take action on those items. But the tools are just tools that you have on your repertoire to be more productive. But at the end of the day, you need to take action on the things that matter the most. Um, so that's that's kind of the way I think about it. Um, I haven't really jumped from tool to tool too much. Uh, I found this this one that I'm working on right now. And it's, it's wonderful because I'm able to connect uh, projects with tasks, with meetings, to notes, to everything. So I create like a, a projects page where everything kind of syncs together and I can see everything like bird's eye view. So it's, it's wonderful. Um, just kind of moving, moving away a little bit from the productivity topic and more into 
uh, some of the other things you're doing with leadership, it, and it's something that I get asked a lot, is how do you become a leader? And like, do you need 10, 20, 15 years of experience to become a leader? Can you be a leader as soon as you graduate from school or even before you graduate from school? Re really good question. And and something that I want, if, if your listeners are going to walk away from this conversation uh, remembering anything, hopefully it's this, is that you don't need anyone's permission to become a leader. There's a difference between leadership and management, right? They, they, they serve different roles and within an organization um, that they, they are treated very differently. You can't just assign yourself the title of manager. Someone, someone needs to give you that job and those responsibilities. Leadership is about the way you behave. No one can give that to you. No one can take that away from you. And I think we've all worked for managers who were excellent leaders. We've probably all worked for managers who were not good leaders. And we probably all also think of people who are excellent leaders within our organization who, who didn't have any formal title. Leadership is about the way you, you see the world. It's about the way you see potential. It's about the way you treat people and comport yourself. Um, so it's my really long-winded way of saying you can lead. You can absolutely lead no matter where you are on on the the organizational ladder no matter you know whether you've been in industry for for decades or, or haven't even started you know if you look back as kids if if, if you played organized sports uh, kids were given the c on their uniform right to to show like you're the captain of this team you can be a leader and that that's something that i think is really important to bear in mind is you know, a kid in sixth grade probably didn't get an MBA, <laughs> right? No one said like, okay, now you're qualified. It's, it's the way that that child behaves. You can learn that at any age. So, so it's, it's absolutely available to anyone and everyone. Uh, very, very important for people to know that. Yeah, that's, that's very true. And um, I don't consider myself a manager. I'm not yet like a project manager at the company I am, but I try to lead by example, volunteering, doing, sharing my story with others, creating this podcast where it's a space where I'm, I'm helping other engineers and students to kind of succeed in their career. So in a sense, I'm building kind of a reputation of, of someone that it's, is leading. It's someone that is trying to help others. And I think that's a very important qualifier for all leaders is is always seek to help others along their path like my experiences are very different from your experiences and i'm sure the people that are listening to this have tremendously different experiences and and the more we share those experiences with each other even if we think they are not valuable for others there's always someone that is going to take away something really important from what we're saying so taking it that into consideration and knowing that a leader is not a title that is given to someone, it's something that you develop, you develop your influence, you develop your skills, communication, writing, all of these things that you are working on. The second you are in school, the second you graduate from high school, or you graduate from university, you are working on the skills that are needed to become a leader. So that's something really important to take away and something really important to realize when, when we're kind of going along our lives. Something I wanted to ask you is, I know you have an MBA, you have a PMP, you have your PE license in Canada. Why is it so important for us to kind of get those licenses or those um, degrees? And when do we know we need to get the degrees other than get the experience? That's something I kind of wrestle myself a little bit, wrestle with myself a little bit. And I know a lot of people have the same question uh, of like, when is it important to get the additional education or the additional uh, degrees or licensures, and what is important to act, actually get the experience and work mm, in the field? Re really, really good question. And I, I guess the, the easy part of that question is with respect to um, your your PE, or in Canada, PNG uh, license. Yep. Um, often, often there are regulatory requirements there, right? Now, depending on what industry you're in, depending on your specific job, you may need your license in order to stamp or sign off on drawings, right? Um, I, and so I would argue that, you know, that, that kind of drives a certain, a certain requirement there for, for many of us, for those who don't have that hard requirement, I would still encourage people to go and get their, their, their PE. And the reason for that is, is twofold. One, 
chances are you're not going to have the job you have today in the company you're in today forever. And who knows what might be next for you. So having those letters, having that designation sets you apart and qualifies you for a broader job market. So that's important. And, and the other is it, it instills a certain sense of, of commitment to your career. And that's, and that's something you need to understand kind of for yourself is that the work that you do is important and the work that you do really can affect the lives of other people. You know, um, I, I, I joke with my wife, my, my wife's an anesthesiologist and if she has a bad day at work, someone could die. Okay. That, that is very serious. But I, what I like to tell her is if I have a bad day at work, hundreds of people could die, <laughs> right? Like th this, you know, yeah. and, and I, I say this a little bit tongue in cheek, but the, the point I'm trying to illustrate is that it, our work really is important and really can affect lives. Um, with respect to other things like advanced degrees and other designations, um, that gets a little bit, that, that's, that's a little, a little more art than science. The first thing that I did after getting my, uh, my P. Angel license, the next major kind of educational milestone was I, I got my MBA um, and I got that several years into my career. I think it was six, six seven years into my career before I started that and doing it part time. And I, I decided to pursue that for a couple of reasons. One is that I recognized in myself that in, in my career, I wanted to, to, to drift towards management as opposed to becoming a guru, right? A, a technical expert. That's just, um, frankly, I took a look at my bookshelf one day and realized that the books were all leadership and management, project management and emotional intelligence. And it was very clear to me what I got, I got excited about. So I wanted to pursue that. The other thing for me is I love learning, right? This is something that I, I still to this day, I love reading. I love learning. I love taking courses. This is something that, that I just get really excited about. In, in retrospect, I'm super, super glad that I didn't try to go back to school right after undergrad. I'm really glad I got out and into industry for a couple of years, particularly with the MBA, because I was able to show up to work the next day after lecture and have light bulbs go off, say, oh, like, this is how I apply this. And that was good for my education. I got more out of what I was learning because it was applied. And my employer got more out of me. So I got a major promotion halfway through my MBA for a job I didn't even remotely qualify for because I was trying things out at work based on what I had learned in school. So it was a beautiful symbiotic relationship working and going to school. Now, now it, was, it was busy, um, but absolutely worth it. Um, pursuing my PMP was kind of similar. It was again, kind of a, a testament to my interest in the management side of engineering. And I wanted something that was very focused, very applied. I've worked my entire career in project environments um, and mostly as either a project manager or a systems engineer. And in, in complex um, projects, the overlap between those, those two fields is, is, is significant. I've also got a, a designation in systems engineering. Um, so it was a, a good way to flesh out my skills on, on both the technical and the managerial side. Um, yeah, it, it, you always want to be learning. It's really, really nice to have that that goal post, that next concrete thing that you're working toward. Um, I find that 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 in and of itself is is a real driver for me to to really push toward learning stuff. Is saying, not only am I going to learn something, I'm going to achieve something, achieve something at the end of it. That that's super important for for me. Yeah, that that's a really good point, and that's something I've tried to do on on my own career. Just I mean, you, you learn a lot of work. You, you have all these, especially when you're a young engineer trying to advance in your career, you have all these new concepts and new knowledge that comes at you once you graduate. But at the same time, reading outside of work, maybe even learning a little bit more of the technical side at the, and at the same time, learning more about soft skills and maybe even learn more about how you learn to, to apply those skills. Because the way you think, the way I think is going to be different uh, I recently finished the book Quiet by Susan Cain, uh, which talked about the difference between introverts and extroverts. And it was a huge eye opener to the way my brain works that I even I, I didn't even know that my brain was working that way. So always trying to learn uh, how you you learn, how you think, how you, your processes are going to be, be a lot better if you learn the way your brain works. 
And the other thing with, with that, what you said is, it's very important to volunteer and, and help, uh, especially as a young engineer with like organizations like here in the US, ASCE, EWB, some of the guys I've, I've been involved with, because they are teaching you the skills that you're gonna need when you become a manager, if that's the path you wanna go at. And a lot of people say, well, volunteering, you're just wasting your time, you're, you're doing all this work and you're not really getting paid, but the value they're giving you, it's way more important than the value money will give you if you if you were getting paid. Um, so that's something I try to encourage a lot of people, a lot of young engineers, students to always volunteer and always be active in, the, in these organizations because it's basically, a free program that they teach you how to speak better, how to write reports, how to do all of these things that you will otherwise will have to pay a lot of money to get that education. Um, with, with that being said, I wanna hear from you kind of what skills do you think young engineers should try to develop and as a, as a project manager and, and leader in, in the profession, kind of what do you see engineers, uh, kind of what, what skills uh, do they have in common when they become leaders? Oh, wow. That, that's a really good question. Um, one of the things that I notice, um, I, I guess first is a, is a, a problem that I notice frequently. And the second is uh, something that I notice for, for engineers who, who got it right and end up in leadership positions. Many engineers are rushing. And, and frankly, early in my career, I was one of them rush to get into formal leadership and management roles uh, because it's exciting and you want to call the shots and you want to feel like you're progressing. I can't emphasize enough uh, how important it is to get your technical skills down, down absolutely 100% solid. That, that is your number one goal early, year, early in your career is practice what you learned in school for at least four or five years and get really, really good. Get your PE, right? Establish that technical baseline. And then once you've done that, decide whether or not it makes sense. Do you, do you want to pursue leadership or management positions? Because by then you'll have been exposed to that world and you'll have gotten your, your technical skills under you, right? Then you can make that call. One of the things that I think is a incredibly important is that in order to lead engineers, and I'm sure this is true in any deep technical field, I'm sure it's as true in, in law and architecture as it is in, in engineering, it's very, very hard to lead if you don't have your technical chops. It's very hard for a team to take you seriously if you don't know what you're talking about. Now, there will come a time in your career where you couldn't possibly know what everyone on your team knows. I'm gonna roll right now. Oh, sorry. I, I'm gonna roll right now where I'm leading a team um, whose, whose technical expertise I have no exposure to at all. Uh, it's called configuration management. Uh, so I'm currently the head of a department I have no experience in. And that's something that I can do at this stage in my career because I have enough peripheral technical experience to know what these guys do basically and why it's important, even though if I were put in their shoes, I would not be able to do what they do. This is a role that I can, I can now hold at this stage in my career uh, because I've got broad technical experience and broad leadership and management experience, right? Every CEO in the world of, of, of a company of any size or consequence could not possibly do all the jobs of the people in their organization, right? Early in your career, you really do need that, that technical, that technical foundation, because that's where you're going to start. You're going to manage a team of pe of your peers, right? People that you know what they're doing, what their work is like. And the strongest leaders that, that I've worked with people who emerge from, you know, individual contributor into uh, informal lead roles and then formal lead roles are technically very, very strong. But then they pair that with strong communication skills. They pair that with leadership skills. They pair that with organizational skills. But they're never. They always have that foundation. Yeah, that's that's some that's some really good point. Like really good advice and really good points. And something that I've noticed in my own career is, yeah, try to develop those skills kind of outside of work. But a lot of times is even become involved with a small company because when you are a small company, you are wearing a lot of hats. 
Um, and that's kind of what I've seen. I've, I've worked on a major company uh, back in South Dakota when I started my career. And now here in Colorado, work from for two relatively small companies. And beyond being an engineer, I'm a marketer. I am a sometimes IT, sometimes doing all these other things that are really not expected from an engineer. But at these small companies, everyone has to pitch in and, and kind of develop all those skills and work um, kind of everywhere in the company. So that that's uh, something I kind of recommend, even if it's just for a year or even just work for a startup or something, you're going to learn a lot in that time to uh, become a better manager kind of later on, on, on your career. Um, do you have any books you recommend maybe students and young engineers to help them develop those uh, leadership skills? Wow, that, that's a really good example. Um, there's um, probably, if, if you're just getting started, um, one of the things, I, I suppose I would recommend an author is uh, John Maxwell. There's virtually nothing that he's written that it doesn't touch <laughs> one way or another on leadership. And it's a really good, uh, really good framework, really good way of, of thinking about leadership. You know, one, one of his big sayings is leaders know the way, go the way and show the way. And no, th th these aren't like academic treatments of, of leadership and the differences between transactional leadership and servant leadership. And, and you can get into all that stuff, but it's a bit heavy and a bit harder to apply. Um, the, other, the other author that I would recommend is uh, Jim Collins. So Jim Collins, um, uh, his, his big, you know, I, I would argue his biggest book is uh, called Good to Great. And that's about how uh, successful companies operate. But there are other books like Great by Choice, which focuses a lot more on, on leadership specifically. Um, th there's some really, really good stuff out there. Um, I'm trying to think of, uh, of any others that I've, I've read recently. Pro probably, probably John Maxwell, the, the 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership is a good, a good starting point, a good uh, a good way to introduce yourself to the to the world of leadership. Yeah, he's a fantastic author. I re recently finished reading the Developing the Leader Within You 2.0. It's a it's a really really good book about leadership and the way he writes is really easy to understand and and it's very applicable to everything um, that I per I'm personally doing. So really easy to read and really easy to understand and and really just go over a great author and, and has a lot of amazing books. Um, I think that's mainly all the questions I have for you. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. Um, I just want to ask you one last question, and that is, how can we continue engineering our future? Oh, wow. Listen, uh, what, what I would say is, is be bold, learn, take action, do things that make you a little bit uncomfortable. Um, very, very important for you, for you to try things, particularly early in your career. And one thing I would offer um, is I, I've created, and, and I didn't tell you about this earlier, but but here we go. Um, uh, I do have a couple mm -hmm. free resources for people who who may want to uh, uh, to develop leadership skills themselves. Um, so if people go to engineeringleadership.com slash leadership 101, I've got a, a free leadership guide for engineers at at any stage in their career. So that's that, that's one one free way that uh, <laughs> that people can learn a little bit. Yeah, thank you so much. I actually downloaded the uh, I can't remember the exact name, but just taking getting more time this six yeah, yeah, that's, concept yeah. you talk about. That that's a great resource. I really enjoyed reading through that and just applying some of the concepts you have there. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for coming to the podcast. I feel like we could stay talking all day about <laughs> all these topics. It's it's something I'm very passionate about and. Uh, maybe I'll have to to get you back on the podcast later on for a, for a follow up. Um, I feel like I tell that to every guest, and it's just amazing conversations we create here on the podcast. And uh, it's it's great that we connected when we did, and, and I'm happy to um, connect with you, learn more about the podcast, learn more about all the things you're doing, and and it's wonderful to see other engineers helping in in the leadership side. I think. We, we as engineers kind of keep a lot of the information to ourselves. So it's always good to see people that are sharing and, and creating content around leadership and, and helping other engineers. Uh, so thank you so much for doing that. Um, and, and for listeners and, and for people that are watching this, where can people find you? What other resources do you have maybe on your website and uh, what are the best ways to reach oh, you? Oh, uh, really good. Um, so engineeringandleadership.com is the blog and all of my podcast episodes are there uh, as well. But if you want to look up 
the Engineering and Leadership podcast that's available through iTunes, podcast, Stitcher, Spotify, all, all the all the major uh, players there. Um, and I'm very active on LinkedIn. So if you look up Patrick Sweet, uh, you'll you'll be sure to find me there. Uh, and I, I you, you can connect with me as well through through my website. Um, the uh, the other resource that you mentioned was uh, finding the sixth day, which the, the, the basic promise there is I offer uh, a number of different strategies that you can use quite quickly to, to create the mythical sixth day, right? The, <laughs> and do all the things that you would do if you just had another day each week. So uh, you can get that at engineeringandleadership.com slash sixth day. So six T-H day. Yeah, thank you so much. That's a good resource. And I'm sure a lot of people are going to go check it out and, and going to find some really good value in it. So thank you so much for being on the podcast. And thank you. So there you have it. That's the conversation with Pat. He is an amazing engineer, an amazing person that is doing a lot of amazing things. He he taught me a lot of things during this episode. I really liked the way he approaches email. And I think it's really important for us to realize that a lot of times email or even our phones, with those social media and notification and everything kind of going on, that's kind of a distraction that is pulling us away from being more productive and being more um, intentional with the things that we're doing. So I really liked his feedback. I really liked all the information he had to share with us today. Thank you so much for coming back to this episode. Make sure you subscribe to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts, and make sure you rate and review the show. It really helps get the word out there. And I really appreciate all the people that have been commenting, leaving reviews, and doing all the great things online because it's helping me making this podcast better, which is my main goal so I can help you become a better engineer in your careers. Again, as I mentioned in previous episode, we are currently growing the newsletter and this newsletter is going to be geared towards a more relaxed conversation and some of the behind the scenes of this podcast and all the things that I've been doing. So if you want to learn more about it, about the newsletter, you can go to luisfelipeduque.com slash newsletter and you'll be able to find a lot more information there thank you so much for coming back to this episode I really appreciate all of you I'll talk to you in the next one but for now let's continue engineering our future